Now, listen up. Three, two, one. It's showtime. That's great. This is ridiculous. 99.3 The Truth. You can't handle the truth right now. Ooh. That was the stupidest thing I ever heard. Let's do it. Hit it. It's time for Max World. And here we go. Everybody here. Everybody here. Let's get it started. Call Matt, 244-0077, or text 809-0993. It's showtime, everybody! Showtime! Exclusively on 99.3 The Truth. Seven minutes after three o'clock. I just try to sound like the serpent, you know. Seven minutes after three on the fourth day of October in the Lord's Year 2016. I'm J. Michael McCoy. We're back. In the saddle again, it's Max World Live here on a Tuesday afternoon. And Tom Coates not in today, as Tom Coates will be here tomorrow. He has a special guest who couldn't be here today, but could be here tomorrow. So uh, we'll be talking politics there. Uh, Mr. Luke Tim, Pastor Luke Tim, Father Luke Tim, Monsignor. Can I say Monsignor to a non-Catholic? Is, is, is that, that's not real. Here, I'll ask the Catholic in the room. Do you know what Monsignor means? Uh, no. Okay, so is Monsignor only a Catholic term? I wouldn't know. I okay. don't know. I want you to Google that. Okay. Find out, because I, I've never heard Mon... I don't think I've ever heard the name or the title of Monsignor used outside of the Catholic Church, but I don't think it's just Catholic. I think it's... It is just Catholic. Oh, it is? You got it in front of you? Yep. Okay. It says somebody Google's faster than the other I people. I guess, yeah. Yeah. It says the title of various senior Roman Catholic positions, such as a prelate or an officer of the papal court. All right, so it's only Roman Catholic. Well, it doesn't give me any other one unless I can go I'll dig deeper. I mean, could you be Lutheran and be a Monsignor? Could you be Episcopalian? Sure. And be a Monsignor? Sure, if you adopt their uh well, that's what I'm trying to figure they out. They adopt their doctrine. No, I'm, well, doctrine. What's doctrine? You, Dogmas. Yeah, that's called religion. Let, let, let's get to relationship and the basics. I can give you the essentials of the gospel. I used to be able to do it in 33 words. Okay. Now I've added one more thing. Here, here's what it used to be. Jesus, through the prophecy of the Old Testament and the prophets, was born of a virgin came to earth, was born of a virgin, testified, died, was buried, and he rose again, all to give me the free gift of salvation. That is, it, it, to me, that's the only essential. Is uh, repentance anywhere in there? Pastor Ryan Jorgensen from Harvest, on Sunday, in a very important meeting in my life, taught me my second essential and that is that the original manuscripts of the new testament are the inerrant work of god i remember we talked about this mm -hmm. yesterday and you don't you don't agree with this no i didn't say that do I you just, agree with it i just was saying do you it's a yes or no answer do well, you since agree i don't read uh, the original manuscripts i can't verify that with 100 percent accuracy all right so is the is this book right over here the layman's parable bible that i've had for 50 years well not really 50 40 um is it the inherent is it the errant word of god inherent word of god the scripture is the in inerrant word of god was the answer <laughs> okay so the original manuscripts is the original it, it well, didn't get better frank sure i agree but since i don't read aramic hebrew greek oh good lord latin this is this is what i deal with i've got i've got michael keaton here working with me do you understand that michael p keaton <laughs> no that wasn't his name what was what was his name michael j fox's name on family ties that was keaton michael keaton right. yeah my, you're my michael keaton in life okay okay robert he was a you raging find liberal uh, the only no he wasn't well on the tv show he was a republican but he's a yeah. liberal in right. real life well i can see even under uh wikipedia is that it's only a catholic term. okay all right so there are no monsignor so it would be wrong to call father luke tim monsignor luke tim well, that brings up the argument, should we call anybody father or reverend? Should they not just be called pastors and ministers? Why? Uh, what does it matter? Well, isn't 
isn't the term uh, reverence just to God? Shouldn't the term father only be to God as, a, you know, as referring to somebody in a ministerial capacity? You know, I've, I've never gr grew up calling anyone father or reverend. I've always called people pastor or minister. Do you really think, Frank, that Papa is upstairs and every time somebody calls Father Adam, Father Adam, that he winches and goes, oh, there's one more I'm not letting in. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. We, we, we've, you know, God's a big dude. God's a big deal. Uh -huh. He's the biggest deal of all. And sometimes, pharisaical people, I won't mention any names. Frank! Well, let me ask you a question. Somehow thinks that God gets easily offended. Do God you, doesn't get offended at all. Do you think we ought to refer to God as the man upstairs? Sure, why not? Well, well who cares? Do you think he cares? I don't... Do th you think he cares? I personally do not believe that shows God much reverence. But do you think he cares? Uh, yeah, I, I think he probably really? cares. Really? You think God's easily offended? I'm, so not, somebody, say so somebody I'm is not saying offended. I'm saying disappointed. Oh, God doesn't get disappointed in us. We're talking about the sovereign of the universe. We're going to call him the man upstairs. Sure. Okay. I call him Papa. Don't you think there's some well, people there's, that would be immensely offended? Muslims would be horribly well, offended Abba, by that. Abba, Father. I mean, I suppose a derivative of Father and Abba and stuff like that would be acceptable. But man upstairs doesn't have anything to do with Father. But why do you? Why? Why are you so pharisaical that you actually think God winches when somebody I'm calls? Not, I'm not earning my place in heaven by what I call the Father. Good, in and you know what? I'm not losing mine either. But I don't believe it's showing God much reverence oh. when we use certain terms. Hi, Bob. How are you? Pretty good. <laughs> oh, I was going to mention, you know, since you guys were talking about the inerrant word of God yeah, and, yeah. And, and all of that. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of translations that have come out, come right. down, you know. I just wanted to bring you back on track again. You know, you guys were just off on a you know, anyway. tangent. Uh, but like the message, which is, have you heard of that Bible? The oh yeah, message? yeah. That was written by one person, God. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. He. It was just one person that came up with his translation of what he believed. Well, that's not the inerrant word of God. Well, see, that's why. That's why Frank was, you know, hesitating because there are different translations, and some. Not people one translation is the inherent word of God. I'm sorry, I believe that. And I think Ryan would back me up on that. And I think other pastors would too. Well, as I said yesterday, the, the original manuscripts were inspired. They were not verbatim, word for word, what God wanted written. So even the people, they were, they were sinful men. They were subject to temptation. They were subject to error. But they were inspired to write something in the language they understood, and they wrote it in the language to other men that other men could understand. And then our translations have come from that. So are those translations the inerrant word of God? The answer is no. And that may be because why there are people that will not use those translations or use those books. They, they, everybody has a certain favorite one. I wish I had my own Bible in front of me because I don't. Bob, do me a favor. Find out where. Here, let me get the Bible out. By the way, it's Alex Keaton, according to Eric. Alex yeah. Keaton. Eric right. Alex P. Who said that? Eric the Cabby. Eric the Cabby. Eric, you're right. Well, I enjoy. <clears throat> hold on. Hold on, Frank. Just a minute. I got to give Bob something to do for a second. Find me the story, and I think it's in Matthew, about. Jesus uh, uh, protecting the prostitute, and this is the place in which he said, those without sin may cast the first stone. Do you know where that is in the Bible? Because I want to point something out to you if I can. Something I just learned Sunday. I just learned, you so just, I'm not... You just learned it? I just learned... I learned what I'm about to tell you. I knew. I know the parable. I know... I mean, that's one of the most famous. What about John 8, 7? Is that what it is? All right, John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All right, so John 8, 7. All right, go ahead, Frank. Go ahead and battle while well, I'm looking. Well, I was just going to mention that once in a while I enjoy reading the New Living Translation, but I don't hold the New Living Translation as the inherent word of God because I believe that it's been pointed out that the New Living Translation 
doesn't make note that there's no remission of sin without blood. There's no remission of sin without blood. Who doesn't say that? The New Living Translation, I've been told, does not point that out. Well, then it's not even a translation. Then, then it's just a story that has B-I-B-L-E on the front. Well, yes, but I'm saying there's certain things to be learned from all translations, but I don't consider all translations equal. All right, so let me uh, let me point something out, and I just learned this, so this is brand new to me. Just nah, in fact, it was about 48 hours ago. On John 7:53 through 8:11, do you know what that story is? John 7:53. And it starts out by saying, then the meeting broke up and everybody went home. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been charged in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust in his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until Jesus had left. Do you know that that's not in the original manuscripts, Frank? Did you know that? The whole story? The whole story. I'll come back. I'll explain it to you. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi. My name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. Hey, everybody. I brought Northern Lights pizza. And it's got Graziano sausage. Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. 
from the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios. This is Webcast One Live. Twenty-one minutes after three o'clock, three twenty-one in the afternoon. Want to say hi to Taylor this afternoon? His first experience with Max World. Taylor, listen. I listen to you every morning, buddy. If I judged you by one or two gigs, one or two bits, I, I you know, so don't don't get upset with me because I didn't understand the word inerrant. These are big words, Taylor. This doesn't even have a hyphen in it. It's so big. Well, you said it did have an hyphen. No hyphen. No hyphen. No hyphen. So, Taylor, I listen to you every morning and listen to you babble through some of the stuff you and Jen do on 1071. <laughs> and I know this is the first time you're listening to Max World Live, so allow me to babble through my stuff, too. I really like that show, though. I got to tell you, I like that show. Well, I know. I, you're supposed to be listening to, uh, you know, well... I can't, I can't, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I can't listen to preaching when I'm working. I have to have music. In fact, when Jen and Taylor come on, or is it Taylor and Jen? I don't know. I don't want to get it wrong. Um, I, I don't. I, I got to kind of stop. If I'm writing something, I kind of. I just. I. I'm not that smart. I'm not the smartest. Right. Yeah. Music is a much better background sound than teaching or talking or yeah, information. Yeah. I, I cannot write commercials. I cannot write blogs. I cannot write articles. I can't write op eds. I can't write emails. If Alistair Bag is chomping on my story, so anyway, so hopefully, hopefully Taylor, you'll 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 give me a pass on the fact that I got the word inerrant wrong. Well, I almost had a wreck. Aha, there it is. I n ooh, it's I n e r r a n t. Inerrant, three syllables, incapable of being wrong. Sounds, hmm. sounds familiar. Yeah, sounds like Frank. <laughs> inerrant. Okay. So what we're talking about here is the fact that Seth Walker is inerrant. <laughs> no, no, I don't think that's what we're talking about. I tell you what, I haven't found it. I, had, I don't think I found him wrong yet. Uh, you but, know, he, but he's definitely capable of being wrong. See, inerrant means it is incapable oh. without the possibility of being wrong. So that, that would really just narrow it down to Frank. It narrows it down to nothing except nothing God. Nothing except God. Yeah. All right, Seth Walker, 577-3728. You know what I'm going to tell you about him, so just do it. Go ahead, Nike it all up. He is a professional realtor. I buy and sell a ton of real estate, and I got to tell you, he's the best partner I've ever had when it comes to real estate. He just, not partner as an investment partner, but I got to have somebody that does the transactions. And I have had the horrible experience of using like a flat fee broker or someone like that just don't just please i i know i know you think you're going to save money but you're not if that flat fee broker is not on the mls the multiple listing service you're done with now let me give you the other side if you know how to work real estate a little bit you're going to get the best deal with somebody who's got a flat fee broker after about 120, 160, 180, 190, 210 days on the market because the only agent showing that home is the fat, fat, the flat fee broker because flat fee brokers don't share commissions with the other realtors. Now think about that. If you're in charge of getting a house for your client, are you going to use somebody that you can't get paid by? I mean, why are you doing it? Seth Walker works with both sides. He's on the MLS. He works for Rob Spearman, greatest broker in town. Give him a call, 577-3728. All right, Frank, we're going back to you. Okay. I just read you John 753 through 811. And okay. this is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Absolutely. And that is when the pharisaical people like you bring a prostitute to Jesus and try to trick him by saying, hmm, the law of Moses says to stone her, Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus' words were back, all right, but let the first one, the one who has not sinned, throw the first stone. Do you know that is not in the original manuscript? Okay, now... Uh, are you trying to tell me that story is not a true, valid story? It's it's uh, slight slight correction. 
I'm, I, I guess I'm in a nitpicky mood today. I apologize. Well, pick some nit. Um, it's not in, in all the manuscripts. The most ancient Greek manuscripts do not include John 7, 53 through 8, 11. That's right. what it says in my Bible. But that doesn't say that that it's not in any of the manuscripts. There, there, there are what hundreds of thousands of manuscripts. We're just talking about in the in the oldest. Uh, that's not included, but isn't included in many other ancient manuscripts. Well, I think it was documented somewhere three hundred A.D. Some monk or some somebody someplace added that story in. I mean, it's acknowledged by the canons that that was not in the original manuscripts. Any of them. It was added several hundred years later. That's that's what I've been told, Bob. Do you, you No, that's not what I've been told. Okay, what have you been told? <clears throat> well, as Chris was saying, there are different different manuscripts and there are other verses too, even in Mark. Uh mm-hmm. th- but there are others that are there that if right. if it's italicized, that means it wasn't in certain manuscripts, but it was in other manuscripts. And why that's why that's even to me even remotely relevant or interesting and should be interesting is not to say that these stories are as frank asked are these stories untrue or these stories inaccurate that's that's not even the right question the 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 thing that should be observed here is to say that uh biblical scholarship meaning that the collection of manuscripts that we have there are so many and um translators people who have taken those and translated them down are being so meticulous that they're saying, if this is not in the majority of the manuscripts that we have, we're going to notate that. It may be in some. In fact, it may be in many. But if it's not in all of them, in fact, if it's only in just a few, we're going to take some of that stuff out. Meaning that what they're trying to do here is look at a a wide uh, width of manuscripts. There's not one single manuscript. That's a misconception a lot of people have, and that's part of the problem with the whole inerrant discussion. Okay, let me tell you what my Bible says. I I don't I'm not interested in what your Bible says. Are you listening to what I'm saying? You're not interested in what the Bible says? (laughs) I'm interested in I'm not interested in what you're Hey, will you get can we just take that little piece off? (laughs) Seriously. I want to get on that real quick. I want that little I want that that, I'm not interested in what the Bible says and And, I want it on a button so every time I want to hear that you could just push a button and it'll be Chris saying I'm not interested in what the Bible says. I think he said what your Bible says. I actually anyway. said what your Bible said, and what you're talking about is not what's in the Scripture. It's, in fact, what you're talking about is in is in zero manuscripts. You're talking about what's in the notes of that printed version of your Bible. The so, most ancient. Greek so he's going to continue to read it and not pay attention to anything that I'm not, saying. Well, why, so I'm going to continue to talk. You're I'm going to. I'm going to continue to talk. Thank you, Luke is here. I'm going to continue to talk. Since you're not listening to me, I'm going to continue to talk. And now we've got a pastor who thinks he knows everything who's going to walk in here and tell us how, how we're all wrong. Hold on. He ran up the stairs. He ran up the I stairs. did literally run here. I was listening in the, in the van. I was driving over. This is um, how I felt earlier. You guys are you're, you're talking about something called textual criticism, and you don't even realize there's a whole field of science and literature behind this. This is an academic discipline that, that has been applied to scripture right. as well as everything else that's ever been written that is old. So there's there's a ton of academic work that goes behind what you guys are discussing on what's the topic right now, this inerrancy of scripture. So what I was saying, uh, Pastor Luke Tim just ran up <laughs> six flights of elevator, stairs. you know. But he couldn't get here that fast if he went took the elevator. Elevator's so slow. maybe, uh, Pastor Luke, if while you're catching your breath, you could hear kind of what I was getting at. The point is to say that stories like this one, it's not to say that those stories are not in any of the manuscripts. It is to say that they're not in the majority of the manuscripts. But hang on. They're not in the earliest and best manuscripts. There's a difference. Not, not all manuscripts are the same. So manuscripts fall into categories called families. There's the, the Byzantine family, the Alexandrian family, uh, the Coptic family. Uh, I'm missing a few here. Um, but at, at any regard, so the, those manuscripts are handed down through church traditions, and you right. can tie them back to these particular families. So we have um, these families of manuscripts that we'll, we'll see that these have more errors and more mistakes in them. And the, that text that is in question you guys are talking about in John, that one is not from a very solid family. And also, when you read it in the Greek, so textual criticism is not just about manuscripts, it's about... Um, reading the literature. As you read through John in Greek, there is a, a very distinctive voice change at that part of the scriptures too. So you have 
Um, it'd, it'd be like Mark Twain rewriting part of Shakespeare. You could tell, right? right. <laughs> he, he might he might get a he might add a scene in it and and do his best Shakespeare impression, but you could tell that that's not. That's not Shakespeare because Mark Twain isn't Shakespeare. So um, that portion of, of text is certainly not in the oldest and best manuscripts and is, is most certainly probably not part of the original work. Now, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be included in your Bible, and it doesn't mean that it is invalidated. Th- those two things are separate. Right, and Pastor Luke, one, one of the things that I was, thank you, that was uh, very well done, especially after climbing f- uh, six flights of stairs, <laughs> but, and then bam, just dropped the book on that. But you realize he just agreed with me. I don't, no, I, no, I never agree with you. Well, but, <laughs> I don't know that. But you I don't and know I that. agree on the same thing here. That it's this not, was not a, but with this this seven fifty three through eight eleven in John was not a part of the original manuscript. It was added later. But but you're probably inappropriately valuing um, this this sense of original manuscript. That that's probably so. If, if you're if you're questioning, um, is this part of the autograph? That's the word you're looking for. Is okay. the autograph is the actual original penned piece of work. And we don't have any of those. Those those have all been lost. What we have are are mostly second generation and third generation copies, and we have fragments of first generation copies. But we don't have anything that that we would say this is the letter that Paul wrote, or this is the gospel that John wrote, verbatim, line for line, the the original original. Those don't exist anymore. Which Why is not? Where'd they go? They're really old, and they just fall apart. Fall apart. And they, they had more use than those copies. Yeah, that's true. So the original ones traveled thousands of miles and, and went all over the place and then were copied and copied. So those originals saw a great deal more use than those second and third generation copies. All right, so somebody made the point to me the other day. I, I gave my 33-word spiel on the essentials. Mm-hmm. Did you hear that when you were driving up here? No, I missed that part. Okay, so... Uh, through the law and the prophets, Jesus was uh, prophesied to be born of a virgin Mary. He came, he taught, he died, he was crucified and was died and rose again on the third day to grant us the free gift of salvation. To me, that's the essential. Mm-hmm. The next essential would be that the, the original manuscripts are the inerrant word of God. However, translations are not. Now, I think you're taking a, a wrong view of Scripture in, in that regard. I think that um, what you have in front of you, that is the inerrant Word of God. It's staring you in the face. So if I, but if, if, if what I had in front of me was, what was the one you called? The message? No. What was the one, Bobby? Yeah, yeah the message. Is the message the inerrant Word of God? Uh, it is my least favorite translation of all time. But it absolutely contains the inerrant word of God. And what about the uh, Bible that the Jehovah Witnesses use? That one is not because it is edited with a doctrinal agenda. As is the Book of Mormon. Correct. The Book of Mormon is is a secondary work um, that there, there are no manuscripts. The the original remember the golden tablets that yeah. the guy found and lost. Yeah. The those were around. never yeah. Okay, we got, we're coming up on a break. When we come back, we'll, 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 we'll readdress this because I think this is important. I think it's very important that Mr. Cal, or Mr. Uh, Roloff understand what it says on the napkin. Wrong! <laughs> coming back live, Luke Tim from Living Faith. Chris is here. Frank's here. Bob's here. Jebediah is here. And most importantly, you're here listening to Max World. Hi, Taylor. On 99.3. Northern Lights Pizza's amazing garlic butter makes amazing breadsticks. Now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, High Bee, and Graziano's. Northern Lights Pizza. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Homs. And I'm the Service Manager. Marketing Director and Client Relations Manager. Everything that we do is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us. 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up 
with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones the same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make Make you smile. That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. It's 3.38, 22 minutes before the top of the hour. Top of the hour, Salem Radio. Re re de 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 uh, uh. Sorry, we had a little cutting out there. Salem Radio Network News coming up at the top of the hour. And then Luke Tim continues today as we talk about the Bible. I don't know. I just thought Christian talk station on the radio. Let's talk about the Baseball. inerrant word of God. <laughs> the inerrant word of it, what, 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 what cannot ever be defiled by man nor beast. It is the inerrant word of God. Now, that would be the original manuscripts wrong <laughs> what <laughs> so the inerr so the the, the the original manuscripts are are inerrant right correct and okay. so is that thing that you have in front of you well I, how how can it be how can how can this this is a translation because the word of god um is not properly understood uh so statically that it, it can only be understood in greek or in latin or in hebrew uh, the inerrant eternal word of God doesn't have a human language to it. So the, the word that is expressed in what you have in front of you is the inerrant word because the spirit is still at work through those, those liter we call them vocables. So what you hear me saying now is a vocable because I'm making a funny sound with my face, right? That's a vocable. Um, but God's word is, is not so limited that it requires a, a certain set of vocables that's found in a specific language or translation. The word of God is active and alive because of the Holy Spirit's work yet today. So what you have in front of you is the inerrant word because the spirit still works. All right, before we get too far down this uh, trail, because I'm, I'm, I hate, I'm just, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bug me because he's like a mentor to me, but wrong. <laughs> but first, I want to remind you that we are now 40, 39, 38, 37, 36 days, 35 days away from Election Day. And the family leader has a, uh, a gift for you. And it's at if714.com, just www. By the way, I hate it when people say WWW. It's W. Not W. That's our, that was our president once. W. If 714.com and every day at 714 in the morning and every day at 714 in the evening, you're going to get a different Bible verse and it's going to have something to do with leadership. 
Ooh, that's what I want to talk about. Anyway, <laughs> it's going to have something to do with leadership and how we can pray for this country as we approach what I've been told by the talking heads is the most important election in our lifetime. And I say it that way because every four years is the most. I've had 16 of them myself. So we are 35 days, 8 hours, 57 minutes, and 18 seconds away from the beginning of Election Day. Uh, actually, this is wrong, you know. That's wrong. Because that goes to midnight on Election Day and polls don't open, but that's okay. Anyway, uh, so basically 35 days until we go. And I want you to go to if714.com and look it up. You just get sign technical. up. And uh, uh, you can get a cool Bible, ver- a good Bible verse every day at 7.14 in the morning and 7.14 in the afternoon, courtesy of the family leader. So Chris's phone was errant? <laughs> Chris's phone was errant. <laughs> I'm actually voting sometime this week. I have a absentee ballot because I, I got stuff to do. That's, that's how you Democrats do it. You like to, you like to <laughs> vote early. <laughs> early and often. He's not a Democrat. I know. It's a joke. Okay. It's a joke, son. Yes. Robert, you have something on the Service Legends Truth Text Line. I do. At 809-0993. It's a question. How do we know the Roman Catholic Catholics or King James didn't leave things out of the Bible we have today for their agenda? Oh, so first and foremost, the King James translation is one of the worst that's ever been put together. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Frank? <laughs> Sorry. You're not going to say anything there? You're going to remain pe- quiet? Uh, we had Michael Damascus in here last week that said it's perfectly one of the, almost one of the better translations. So, so now, how do guys 17 miles apart not get that? So the, uh, the translation that was put together by this guy named Erasmus, again, um, this is kind of nerding out a little bit on textual criticism stuff, so I apologize if this gets boring. But there was a, a bit of a race to get the first um, translation done um, that, would, that would be a full Greek manuscript, just pull one thing together, and to get that printed. And so this, this is before James, mind you. This, this is not the King James. This is pre-King James. So um, this guy Erasmus was trying to pull all this stuff together, and he had some competition, and for the life of me, maybe Bob can look this up. I can't remember. I want to say Copernicus, but I know it's not Copernicus, but there's some <laughs> dude who was racing Erasmus to get this translation together. And um, at the end of it, uh, Erasmus didn't have all of the manuscripts that he needed. In fact, he only had a handful of Greek manuscripts to try and pull the entire New Testament together. So, like, even for, like, the last six verses of Revelation, Erasmus didn't have any Greek manuscripts for it. So, he went to the Latin. He went to the Vulgate, um, which is the, the name of the Latin translation of Greek texts that that um, goes back a great deal of time he used that and translated latin into greek to use as part of his translation Uh, so he didn't have source manuscripts for a fair amount of the new testament he only had a couple of the greek manuscripts and they weren't the most reliable at the time so the the very most reliable manuscripts have been found even since Erasmus lived and died. So that was Erasmus is like 1525 or something like that when he pulled together 1530 maybe, somewhere in that ballpark. He died in 1536. He died in 1536. Well, I know it was before he died. He did this work. <laughs> <laughs> of that, I am confident. Um, so, so he pulled together um, a New Testament Greek translation that then later was used uh, as the basis for the King James Version. And so the, the foundational Greek text that's used is, is not really all that great. The reason why some people claim that it, it is great is because it was adopted by the Catholic Church, canonized by the Catholic Church, and said, this is the text. And um, so if, if you believe in ongoing revelation, if you, if you believe that the, the church can canonize something and say, regardless of any other later evidence of what we find, this is the best thing, then yeah, of course, the King James Version is the best because it was declared so. But if you believe, like like I believe, and, and most um, Orthodox Christians believe that the canon remains open, meaning if uh, somebody woods there or woods in the desert somewhere in the Middle East and found a cave and found Third Corinthians, and we were able to verify it and and pull it together and say this is authentic. We, it would take time, but there'd be meetings, there'd be academic work done, and eventually you would have another book to your Bible. I, 
Wasn't it you that told me we have a third Corinthians? There is most likely a third letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians because he references it in his works, but we don't have it. Okay. So, and it's entirely like. Wait a minute. I think I have it. Let me run home quick and check the safe. Oh my, it's on papaya or papayas or bananas. It's on orange peels. I have it. I have Corinthians 3. Or as Donald Trump would say, 3 Corinthians. Yeah, Chris. Go ahead. How do you follow that? Um, but <laughs> carefully. He, not carefully. intelligently. Very carefully. Yeah. Uh, let's come down from that. That was great. Um, you said an, an incredibly inflammatory thing, and I, I heard all kinds of Orthodox Christians, uh, evangelicals, throwing things at their radio. I felt them. They hit me <laughs> when you said that the canon remains open. That's a very dangerous statement to make because there are some people who would say, uh, hear you saying that and believe that what you mean is that there is new revelation yet to come. No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, good catch, though. What I'm saying is is not that um, that Chris is going to sit down and write a letter to somebody and that's going to become scripture. Right. What we're saying is those original authors most likely wrote more than the handful of letters that we have. And if we were to find one of those original apostles' letters and were able to historically verify it, the canon remains open. Well, and that's a, I think that's an important key because I think it was just a few years ago that we had the book of Judas that came out um, <laughs> yeah. and, and things like that. So people people hear about these and they go, well, that must be uh, accurate. And there is academic rigor that goes into this. You know, people aren't looking uh, for new secondary odd revelation and it should be consistent. If we do find it, we should expect it to be consistent with the whole of the other 66 books already. We should talk about the Gospel of Thomas next. That's a fun one to discuss. Right. The Gospel of Thomas coming up next with Monsignor Luke <laughs> here live in Max World on 99.3, powered by webcast1live.com. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coach with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Rockton Prevention is celebrating 25 years of creating a caring community. We want to say thank you to the tens of thousands of Rock High School mentors that have carried our message of health, love, and encouragement to over 1.5 million children, teachers, and parents. Our mentors teach children methods and skills to prevent bullying and drug use. Thank you to all the school administrators, teachers, and counselors for the opportunity to serve you. Rock on, fair citizens. Rock on. This is Pat McManus for Rock and Prevention, the Richard O. Jacobson Foundation, and this station. Northern Lights Pizza, your home of the tasty crust. Our garlic butter sauce now available in 12-ounce bottles at Northern Lights, Hy-Vee, and Graziano. Northern Lights Pizza. Hi, my name is David Burrier, your Hope Coach. I host a live weekly talk show called I've Been There every Thursday afternoon at 5.30, right here on webcast1live.com and on my weekly radio program Saturday mornings at 10 on Truth Network 99.3 FM. I interview common, everyday people who have survived incredible life challenges and who testify to God's faithfulness in the midst of their storms. So join me as we bring a message of hope and encouragement. Everybody needs hope. I know, because I've been there. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Three fifty, ten minutes before the top of the hour. Um, Luke Tim is here from uh, Living Faith Lutheran Church, hundred and forty second and Hickman services at uh, nine a.m. on Sunday morning. You're welcome to stop by. Also, I want to remind you that I am discovering um, some really interesting things in my new house. 
This is the oldest house I've ever bought. Uh, this house was built in 1954. In fact, it won the 1955 Des Moines Home Show award winner. And most of the plumbing is original. And so I had uh, the Culligan man. How does that sound, Frank? Hey, Culligan man. No, that was terrible. Okay. Come on, do it right. Hey, Culligan man. There you go. At 274-2573, I've had them come in and put in the osmos- reverse osmosis system and everything like that. Well, nobody ever had a water softener in this house. And I'm going to probably pay for it. Mm. I mean, I'm going to soften my water from now on, but it looks like nobody ever had it before. And I just want to tell you, it is a big, big um, item for resale when you put water softener. It's not about the way the water feels. It's about the quality that has been run through your pipes. Let me give you an example. And, and, and if I'm getting too car nerdy here, I apologize. You can go to Walmart and buy a can of Quaker State Standard Oil for what? Three bucks, four bucks. Get three or four quarts. Put it in your car. You got 20 bucks in your, 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 your oil. And somewhere around 3,000 miles later, you're going to have to change it. I put synthetic oil in my car. Now, granted, it's 160 bucks to change my oil. But I just passed 15,000 miles. What Culligan does is put synthetic... Well, I could better back up. What Culligan does is put the best lubricant that they can inside your water so it cleans the pipes as it flows through them you can remove dirt silt clay unpleasant odors including that horrible rotten egg and chlorine smell culligan is not just about softer water or reverse osmosis or something like this and i guess i can say to you as a homeowner who just bought a home that's uh 55 years no 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 yeah, 50, well, whatever it is, 60 years old. Yeah, 60 years old. Um, I'm going to have to replace some of the plumbing because they didn't have a Culligan water softener. So if you want to get good money for your return on investment on your home, just put a Culligan water system in. And the next person who comes along and buys it will appreciate it. 274-2574, just give them a call. Hey, Culligan man. We found a use for him. Yep. Yep. All right, so Luke Tim is here, and you wanted to start with the uh, Gospel of Thomas. Yeah, so um, Chris asked a great question about the the canon being opened and how um, we have these other works that are out there, and um, they have, over time, been appropriated by Hollywood and uh, authors and stuff like that. Um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he wrote that one stupid book um, that I hated so much that I can't remember the title of that either. I remember the guy who goes around looking for the Gospel of Thomas and, and trying to find Jesus' offspring. Or are you talking about uh, the guy that wrote uh, the uh, Da Vinci Code? Yeah, there it is. That's what it is. Brown. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of that's based off of the Gospel of Thomas. Well, that's a great example of, um, there is a Gospel of Thomas, and they they talk about in the book, and they talk about in the movie how it's been kept from us by the Catholic Church. It's been hidden from us because they don't want us to find it. No, you can go and get it at most libraries, and the <laughs> Rome has copies of it. They don't let you have them because they're really old, and they don't want you to break them. So, I mean, you... Conspiracy. Right, it's it's the furthest from a conspiracy. They're, they just kind of, all of Rome just kind of nodded their head and went, yeah, we know. Like, we've had these for a super long time. But what they discovered was that they were um, not, they were false copies. They're from a group of people called the Gnostics, uh, who existed before Christianity, but kind of appropriated some Christian teachings and uh, pulled that into their faith and their and their traditions um, and continued to write their own works. So one of the things that we can tell from the Gospel of Thomas is that it is falsely written because it references a couple of events and uh, a couple of, um, in fact, I think there's some kind of game the kids were playing as kids that uh, we know is more like a fourth or fifth century event, uh, much further after Jesus' death than Thomas would have been able to write. So you're saying that, that shoots and ladders is in the Gospel of Thomas, <laughs> and so th- that doesn't make it very authentic. I see. Yeah, yeah it's like if, if the Gospel of Thomas referenced a 57 Chevy, you'd go, nah. <laughs> There's a chance that wasn't written by Thomas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so some of those, those, of course, those aren't going to make it into the canon. Um, but there's other things like like Sinaiticus um, and some of these other things where where they found these uh, incredibly um, 
well-preserved documents just much later than, than was pulled together by Erasmus and some of these early compilers of the Greek manuscripts. Um, and it's, it's always possible. Like with the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls is a great example. So this kid's wandering around, um, throws a rock into a cave, hears something break, goes in and finds all of these jars that are clay jars full of these ancient, ancient Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts. Well, they start, one of my professors in, in a um, seminary in, in college was actually um, one of the guys who translated a portion of this. And it's, so this, this is kind of why I got nerdied on it. And I haven't studied this in forever. So if I, if I misspeak a couple of things, it's because I haven't looked at this stuff in years. But what was cool is that they, they pulled all of these manuscripts out and were excited to find out if like some of those um, prophecies that came true in Isaiah. Some people postulated that, well, you know, the, the critics of Christianity and, and such would say, well, the, those couldn't be original because there's no way they would have known these things in advance. So these must have been added in later. Well, they unroll Isaiah and they find one scroll, no edits, nothing cut out, includes all of those um, texts that talked about those prophecies. And it pushed what our earliest manuscripts of the Old Testament were back by about a thousand years earlier. And it was 100% accurate. So it was a, a gold mine as far as text goes. But what if they had pulled that out and found um, something else that we could authenticate as part of the Old Testament? Well, absolutely. With, with academic rigor and time and, and church council gatherings, there could easily have been an addition if we'd have found something that was credible. And we haven't. And with every year that goes by, with every archaeological dig, we, we get one step further away from finding uh, anything that would be uh, likely to be put into the canon. So it seems less and less likely every year that we're going to have 67 books of the Bible, but it's possible. All right, Luke Tim is here from Living Faith Lutheran Church, 142nd and Hickman. Services uh, at uh, 9 o'clock every Sunday morning followed by the alpha class which I suppose you could still get in if you wanted to but man you better do it now you better call living faith uh, get, what's the number uh, 515-987-4030 and just sweet talk Joanne you know, promise her cookies or something that you could get in <laughs> alright we're coming back and one of the things I want to talk about is do, do we do we really are we really instructed by the Bible to do whatever our government tells us to do in Romans 13 I think you'll be pleasantly surprised but we'll talk about it next live here on the truth <laughs> 